They are symbols of union between people. Ever since, bridges have been the prerequisite of trade and traffic. To get them out of the ground, some called for incredible feats. In terms of innovative technology, speed of construction and daring design, bridges have set multiple records in the world of civil engineering. We had to start from scratch. We were the avant-garde as far as public works are concerned. Three bridges that have left their mark in history. The Pont de Gare, the Millor Viaduct, the Viaduct of Garabit. From the moment it was conceived until its inauguration, the viaduct of Millor caught the imagination of the world. A colossus, 2,460 meters long, supported by the tallest piers ever erected, weighing around 290,000 tons, constructed in a mere three years to the day. The Millor viaduct is a monument to high precision work and the will to take on awe-inspiring challenges. In the region of Occitania, in the south of France, lies the city of Millor. At the end of the last century, Millor is well known throughout the country, yet for the wrong reasons. Each year in summer, there are kilometers of traffic jams. It's nothing new for drivers passing through Millor. The A75 connects northern Europe to the Mediterranean. Before the completion of the viaduct, it was necessary to leave the highway, manage the narrow streets of the small town of Millor, and then regain the expressway. It was infernal. Even we locals were tricked by the maze of small rural roads, but for people who had just begun their first days of vacation, imagine what it was like to be stuck in a traffic jam for five hours. Record bottlenecks each year, a region unable to develop its economy. In the 1990s, the powers that be decide to build a viaduct that would link the Tarn Valley with the overland traffic. It will be designed by the British architect, Lord Norman Foster. The task of steering the project in the field is assigned to Michel Villageur, one of the foremost specialists in the world of bridges and viaducts. Among his prior achievements are the Normandy Bridge and, more recently, the Yavuz Sultan Selim Bridge in Istanbul. The challenge he faces is daunting, as the length and height of the bridge promise to be gigantic. The scope of the work is considerable, to say the least, and the feasibility studies are themselves a huge task. A project like this requires an enormous amount of time. Between the search for the actual route and the cutting of the ribbon, exactly 17 years went by. Thus, in October 2001, work on the foundations begins. Yet each of the seven pylons which will support the highway section requires a substructure. It will serve as a base for the foundations, since the ground is far from being flat. The valley is steep, so to root the foundations, a substructure is mandatory, with dimensions already impressive. Moroccan wells are dug, vertical tubes reaching several meters deep, which will provide a hold within the hard rock. They're like well shafts below the concrete footing. They're five meters in diameter and up to 18 meters deep, like the feet of an elephant. They're not straight, but slightly inclined. The length of the individual tubes depends on the depth of which the rock is hard. Five or 18 meters may seem a lot, but as a support to a pylon that is 245 meters high, they're very small roots for a very big tree. Once hard rock is reached, each tube is filled with concrete. 
Thus, the combined weight of the pylons and the actual roadway rests on an extremely stable base. But there's another highlight, the optical effect. It was Norman Foster's idea that the pylons should emerge from the natural terrain. Once the foundations are finished, the pylons will be erected. There'll be seven in all, built simultaneously, each spaced 342 meters apart. With a very particular technique. The pylons are poured with concrete on site directly above the foundations, in successive slices four meters high, with a mobile framework which acts as a mold. When a slice of four meters is dry, the framework will go up using rails inside the shafts, and the workers will be able to pour a further four meters of concrete, allowing for extremely fast progress. Every three days we had another four meters built. It was pretty impressive to come every day and see how it moved steadily upwards. The pylons are rising higher and higher, but not all are the same size. P1 and P7 at the ends are the smallest, at 94 and 77 meters respectively. P4, P5 and P6 reach up to between 100 and 150 meters, but it's P2 and P3 that impress the most. P2 is a colossus in itself, and like the other six, it's split or doubled in its upper part. All pylons are made this way, including the smallest, P7. The split sets in at 90 meters. One of the reasons is overall aesthetics. It lends grace to the pylons. It gives them a finesse, which is quite important and impressive. Yet splitting them was also a necessity. Since the viaduct of Millor moves, deforms, lengthens, shrinks, contorts. All this is vital for the durability of the work and is due to several factors. The first is a formidable enemy. It's the notorious wind of the region. The wind in Mio is particularly aggressive. Wind has a major impact on stretched out bridges, especially given the shape of this valley, the deepest part of the French plateau. The wind is completely transformed during the passage of the valley and can vigorously shake the pylons. In the valley, the wind can exceed 100 kilometers per hour. To reduce the influence of the wind on the pylons, the team of Michel Villageux split their upper parts so that the wind will pass through, thus lessening its impact. The deck rests on the pylons, but it's not merely laid down, it's also hooked. There are cable systems to keep it from being raised when there is wind. Thus, a pylon may oscillate up to 60 centimeters in a violent wind. This relative flexibility, due to the number of supports, avoids over-constraint to the single pylon, enabling it to resist the force of the wind. 60 centimetres is a lot for traffic, so we close the bridge when there are winds of this magnitude. It will take a year and a half before all the seven pylons have reached the same level. Yet it's only then that the most critical phase begins, moving the road section on top of each of the seven piles. To achieve this, the engineers adopt a technology as spectacular as it is effective. The road deck will arrive in parts. On either side of the valley, the workers are continually receiving parts of the deck ready to be assembled. The parts are made from sheet metal. Of course, it's necessary to cut these sheets. However, this is never done on site, but in factories with the proper machinery. The strategy put in place is to assemble the deck on each side of the valley, 
then to push forward the parts from both sides until they join together. Yet to get there, you have to overcome a major problem. The distance between the pylons is 342 meters. As it's far too risky to push thousands of tons into the empty space over such a distance, temporary towers are erected to reduce the crossing of the void. They will allow the road deck to have a support every 171 meters. These gigantic structures made of metal and up to 200 meters high will only stand during the actual construction of the bridge. Yet what looks like mere scaffolding will help secure the moving of the deck. A feat that will be possible thanks to a unique device, the translator. We had to develop a prototype. The translators are placed within the concrete abutments on both ends of the bridge, which support the steel span. A translator is a hoist, which allows the deck to be advanced over the void to the next pylon or steel tower, based on a simple principle. The translator operates by two wedges under the deck. It raises it, moves it forward, then rests it, before raising it again, moving it further forward. The operation is repeated almost 300 times until the deck reaches its next support. You lift, you push, you lower, you go back, you lift again. It's a 60 centimeter shot each time. The deck advances as the translator moves forth and back until, after 171 meters, it reaches the next pylon or the next tower. It's an extremely tricky operation with the deck advancing over the void of more than 200 meters above the ground. Everyone was worried, is it going to break? But it was pretty impressive to see this huge mass of metal moving like, well, a piece of spaghetti over these heights. Whenever the deck settles on the top of a pylon or tower, additional translators are brought forward. As the road deck progresses, it becomes ever longer and heavier and requires more and more power to lift it. Dozens of computers are working as a network to operate the translators. Synchronization must be to a thousandth of a second to lift the span at the same time at its points of support, as well as advance it by the same momentum. There are up to 64 translators for moving the 36,000 tons of the deck. It was paramount that all the translators worked at the same time and that the pylons or the steel towers didn't oscillate too much during the movement. To verify that, there were lasers fixed on the ground pointing to the top of the towers and pylons to make sure that we ended up within the defined target. Thrusting a span over 171 meters to the next support takes three days. It's a formidable challenge, since this phase of construction with thousands of tons suspended over a void does not brook any interruption. To initiate a push, we needed wind conditions of less than 72 kilometers per hour for three days. So the Met people had to be able to forecast three or four days during which there would not be a wind stronger than that. To save time, the teams will be working from both ends of the bridge, starting with the southern span. Its northern counterpart will be launched several months later. The precision was exceptional, since we had a deviation of less than 10 millimeters, both in the lateral and in the vertical. A feat even more impressive, because the two road decks were prepared at different times of the year, in different factories, and by different teams of engineers and workers. There was indeed fear that the parts wouldn't fit. But on May 28, 2004, at 1412, the decks are joined. It's the culmination of 15 months of thrust. I must tell you that when the two banks of the Tarn Valley finally met, my throat was tight, like I was strangled. If 
vous regardez l'image de la de la If you look at the deck at the time of its junction, you will see that the structure is actually undulated iron. Vous allez constater que le tablier c'est une véritable tôle ondulée. Once the deck is linked into a single unit, five masts will be positioned, each on top of a pylon, and each the size of a 29-story building weighing 700 tons. The masts are first transported in parts lying down by four trailers each, then joined, grabbed by immense arms of steel and tilted upwards on top of the pylons. Putting the masts in place takes three months. To an engineer like Michel Villelogieux, it's nothing new. The basic procedure proved itself thousands of years ago. It's like with the obelisks. An obelisk was finished on the ground, then the Egyptians raised it by a combination of cable systems and holes. The masts of the Mio viaduct have been raised in exactly the same way. Then the masts are connected to the deck by stays on each side, so that the weight of the deck between two piers will rest on the vertical axis of each pier. The deck is held by cables, which act as stays on the pylon. On each side of a mast, there are 11 stays attached to the deck, making for a total of 154 stays. Inside, they are filled with steel cables. Thus, each stay supports an average of 240 tons of the deck, which weighs a total of 36,000 tons. The stays have a lifespan of about 40 years before they'll have to be replaced. The future highway has finally breached the 2,460 meters of the Tarn Valley. Like the piers, the whole bridge has been designed to withstand the force of the wind. The aerodynamics of the deck are that of an inverted airplane wing. Thus, gusts exceeding 150 kilometers per hour will not lift the deck but press it onto its supports. My people worked 80,000 hours in total on the steel structure. That's the equivalent of 55 years for a single person. And of those 80,000 hours, at least 85% were spent solely on construction. The viaduct can withstand gales of up to 205 kilometers per hour. But there's another impacting phenomenon, dilation. People have trouble imagining that the viaduct is actually moving. It will stretch with the summer heat, especially the metal deck. In winter, on the other hand, it shrinks, it retracts. The deck is not made of concrete like the piers, but of steel, a material that has a huge advantage. It's lighter than a concrete deck, which, because of its weight, would have needed twice as many stays, and thus would have resulted in a less airy appearance. Yet steel has a particularity. Its structure deforms with the changes in temperature. At the Millor viaduct, the amplitude between winter and summer can reach up to 1.8 meters. To smooth the impact, two joints are positioned on both ends of the bridge. They provide the junction between the concrete abutment that does not move and the steel deck that does. But here, we're talking about joints of two meters each. Under the joints, there's a ruler that allows the deformations of the deck in one direction or the other to be read by the naked eye. Back then, during the first days of the summer heat, we watched it almost minute by minute, because we didn't really know if we were within the marks or not. The sensitive zones of the joints require numerous safety tests. It had to be ensured that they wouldn't collapse under the repeated passage of heavy goods vehicles. 30 trucks are moving onto the viaduct, weighing 26 tons each, a total of almost 900 tons. The trucks are parked in the middle of the bridge for an hour between two piers, a situation that never occurs during circulation, but it provides an excellent test. The engineers check the inclination that could result from the additional weight. But there's nothing to worry about. Inside the road deck, they're preparing to fight an enemy that could wreak havoc if they let it. 
Rust. Rust is poison to steelworks, especially if one is over 2,500 meters long. And in view of such dimensions, putting on a layer of anti-rust is hardly feasible. Given its surface area, painting would have taken a very long time and cost a lot of money. So we installed the dehumidification system that keeps the humidity level inside the deck at less than 45%. In all, nine units are thus put in place, one under each mast and two at both ends of the viaduct. Now the coating of the deck can start. 10,000 tons of bitumen are spread in a mere four days. Then the signal system is installed, and with that, after three years of work, the viaduct of Millor is finished. The result is astounding. The calculations of the planners have been turned into reality. Everyone is impressed. The effect of the real scale cannot be pre-planned on paper. It's really quite spectacular. And to increase the pleasure of crossing the Tarn Valley on this new stretch of motorway, the designers worked on an additional visual effect. If the viaduct was straight, a driver coming onto it would see just the one mast in front of him. If I build in a slight curve, this allows the piers to be seen one after another. And in the distance, you see the end of the viaduct while you're still at the first pier. This curve of the viaduct is unique, beautiful. The viaduct is planned for an initial duration of 120 years. Yet it may have a much longer lifespan ahead of it. The Millor viaduct still has some way to go before it catches up with the longevity of one of its most famous neighbors. A masterpiece of ancient architecture, a grandiose monument, a record-breaking achievement of its time. And still there after 2,000 years of existence. The Pont du Gard is studied with superlatives, in terms of construction as the highest bridge of its time because of its ingenious design. In short, the Pont du Gard fascinates more than ever. More than a million and a half visitors come to stroll across its central aisle each year, experiencing the last surviving bridge of the Roman world with these dimensions. We're in southern France, near the city of Nîmes. Here, between two cliffs, abundant forests, and a river as limpid as it is indomitable, depending on the day, arises this ancient giant of a bridge. At 49 meters high, 275 meters long, and with 64 arches on three levels, one of which ranks as the largest of all antiquity, the Pont du Gard is one of the most impressive emblems of the Roman era still standing. To understand the challenge posed by the project, one of the most daring civil engineering works in the world, we must go back in time, into the first century AD. Back then, the whole region is under Roman rule. Its capital, Nîmes, was founded by the local Celtic tribe. Throughout the empire, cities looked to Rome as a model. So people adopted the Roman way of life, its administration, its monuments. When we speak of Romanization, that's precisely what we mean. And the key element to turn Nîmes into a true Roman city is water. Water was a symbol of luxury, power and wealth. What is sought after above all is to have water brought to you via pressure, up to the highest floors of a building where those in power reside. The baths, which were immensely popular among Romans, also require an immense amount of water, much more than could be provided by the source under the city of Nîmes. We know that a citizen of Nîmes, Wandumukas Arthur, had an important office in Rome. He was the water curator, meaning he was responsible for all water management in Rome and beyond. And for Arthur, the solution to the problem of bringing water in sufficient quantity to the city of Nîmes 
is the construction of an aqueduct, a kind of a long pipe wherein water can flow from point A to point B. So they choose a source at high ground, and thanks to the slope, the gravity, its water will flow until it reaches the cisterns of the city. In this case, the source is near Uzes, about 50 kilometers from Nîmes. This may sound quite a stretch, yet distance is not a handicap. The Romans have already built aqueducts of over 90 kilometers. It's the minimal incline between the two cities that poses the actual problem. The difference in height between the points of departure and arrival is merely 12.6 meters. So the average slope of this aqueduct is 25 centimeters per kilometer. That's tiny. Therefore, to achieve a steady incline, accurate calculations are called for. Yet there's another obstacle. Along the course of the aqueduct, it's necessary to cross the Garden Valley, which is particularly deep. Through scrublands, forests, or even using tunnels, Roman aqueducts generally pass everywhere. But to pass over a river, the waters of which can rise to 15 meters, while maintaining an incline that is neither too steep nor too flat, is quite a different matter. So the Romans opted to build a singularly high bridge. A bridge high enough to take the aqueduct to the other side of the gorges of the Gardon River. Yet the water curator, Dumukas Arfa, is ready to raise what seems at the time a crazy gamble. To build the highest bridge the world has seen up until then. It's actually three bridges on top of each other. The top one contains the speakers, the pipe itself. A bridge like that will require a gigantic site. Yet the first task is to find a quarry capable of providing enough rocks of adequate quality. And it is less than 600 meters away. The biggest blocks cut here weigh up to six tons and will be built into the piers of the bridge. However, tools are rudimentary. Picks and pickaxes. It's all well and good to cut stones into shape, but to put them in place, you have to find solutions for lifting and handling. This is when wheel and winch make their appearance on the site. It's an ingenious lifting system from the maritime world. One, two or more men are placed inside a wheel and start walking. A rope connected to a winch allows their force to be multiplied and to lift blocks of several tons. American colleagues experimented with three or four students inside the wheel. They raised several tons that way. It's exhausting work done by slaves. This way, dozens of blocks come out of the quarry every week. They're put on barges that are towed upstream. The blocks are then placed on rollers and pushed onto the large artificial platform that serves as the base of the site. The stones arrived as crude extractions from the quarry. They were finished here on this large surface, which had been smoothed with gravel, so as to allow assembling the blocks with great precision. It's here that the blocks are given their final shape, right down to the last millimeter. The Romans used to rub the stones against each other so they fitted perfectly. They also used abrasive red sand to achieve perfect alignment. It's absolutely essential to have a surface of maximum friction. The stones must not move. Assembling the finished blocks amounted to a kind of puzzle. Each block was given a number. Some still show the traces of the engraved figures. Then they were put into place as if it were a piece of furniture. The procedure is called dry assembly. There's no mortar between the blocks. Their mass and the perfection of their size keeps them in place. Two blocks are brought into position, one on top of the other. And almost immediately they sit as tightly as if they had never been separated. You couldn't even slip a cigarette paper between them. It's impossible. The actual construction begins with the largest arches. 
The heaviest blocks are placed first. Then a wooden arch, called a formwork, is erected on this base. This allows the stones to be assembled. As long as the final stone is not yet there, the masonry is not under tension, and obviously if you remove the formwork, everything will collapse. So the final stone is the keystone. The highest arch is the one that spans the river proper. It's 24.5 meters wide, the largest of all arches built in the Roman Empire. Its neighbors are about 20 meters wide. There are six of them at the base of the bridge. To continue the work and to add two more levels, the architects used a technique the traces of which are still visible. On all levels, you can see blocks that are protruding, most likely to hang the scaffolding. These blocks, called headers, are on each side of the bridge. They probably also serve to maintain the balance, the stability of the whole edifice, since they are quite long and traverse the piers from both ends. On the first and second levels, you have the big ones. These blocks are truly enormous. Transporting, finishing and finally lifting them into place must have taken several weeks. It's estimated that one block weighs the equivalent of five cars. Up on the third level, there's a small covered canal built from rubble. The stones here are about 40 centimeters thick. The canal constitutes the strategic part of the bridge, that of an aqueduct. It has a constant width of 1.35 meters. The walls are made of crushed tiles mixed with lime, which makes them completely waterproof. Usually we find this in public baths, in the basins, as you don't want the water to seep into the ground, unlike in sewers where the walls are left bare. So here they plastered the walls with concrete. A waterproofing layer on the sides, but curiously, not on the floor of the aqueduct. Well, we don't know what happened, but obviously somebody made a mistake and forgot to have the bottom covered with concrete. The result is leaks and damage to the upper parts of the bridge. Another problem must have appeared early on. Sometimes too much water would cause overflows since the walls of the aqueduct were not high enough so ever more water seeped into the masonry of the bridge. The problem also resulted from the incline of the overall aqueduct. The slope of the ducts north of the bridge was too steep, causing thousands of cubic meters of water to rush onto the bridge. As the water overflowed the top of the Pont du Gard, they had to get back to work and raise the aqueduct over a stretch of about six kilometers to avoid two violent overflows. Another explanation for the rapid degradation of the stones is their quality. When you build, you favor hard stones at the base. Further up, you may use soft stone and maybe firmer stone for anything to do with decoration. Yet all that will undergo degradation, erosion by rain or wind. So you tend to avoid using soft stone. Yet the Pont du Gard is made exclusively of soft stone. Soft stones are easy to cut with simple tooth saws, but they absorb water because of their porosity. And that's a real problem when you know that the arches of the bridge will have their feet in the water during the notorious floods of the region. One of the characteristics of the Gardon is that it's a Mediterranean watercourse. So it will have a more or less regular oscillation between extreme weather situations. For instance, severe droughts in summer. And there are periods of violent and devastating floods, which generally occur between September and October. In 2002, torrential rains fell on the Gar region the equivalent of eight months in a single day. As the river turns into a torrent, the lower arches of the bridge are almost underwater. Yet these floods were taken into account right from the beginning 
and pushed the architects to establish a record for their times. The Romans positioned piers on both banks of the river and spanned it with a single arch, yet that forced them to erect an arch more than 25 meters wide, which is quite exceptional. The Pont du Gard has a lot of openings, so it lets in a lot of water. However, that's why it can withstand floods considerably better, since there is less internal pressure on the arches compared to bridges built with much smaller ones. Another problem caused by the floods is that everything carried along by the rushing water can damage the piers of the bridge. Projections are thus positioned on each pier, downstream as well as upstream of the bridge. These prows will deflect the current to pass along the sides. The projections provided the finishing touch to the work. Four years have been necessary to span the river. Despite its problems of water tightness, the aqueduct served the city of Nîmes for over 450 years. Then it was abandoned. But it could have suffered a worse fate. After the fall of the Roman Empire, the ends or abutments of the aqueduct served as a quarry for the inhabitants of the area to build houses or churches. Yet the Pont du Gard as a whole was spared. Since 1985, it joined the UNESCO World Heritage List. The Pont du Gard, a masterpiece of the Roman era, had long been the only architectural showpiece of the region. But a little less than 2,000 years after its construction, another bridge, 200 kilometers away, revolutionized the world of civil engineering. Like the Pont du Gard, it also set a record for the largest bridge ever built. It's one of the major works of Gustave Eiffel. Five years before the construction of the tower in Paris that bears his name, Eiffel creates an incredible viaduct for the time. More than 3,000 tons of iron, a deck 564 meters long, a height of 122 meters. In 1880, this is the site that everyone is talking about, and its fame will spread around the world among engineers. A spectacular site for the highest bridge ever built at the time. But it's also a risky site, and many people will harbor doubts until the last moment. Even the French state wonders for a long time if this viaduct were not madness. About 145 kilometers from Clermont-Ferrand, a river, the Tuyer, crosses France's central plateau. Wide and deep, the Tuyer gorges constituted a natural border. In the 19th century, they cut off those who lived in the south from export and prevented farmers from selling their products up north. It's the winemakers who finally punch the table. They want a direct way to bring their wines to Paris. Yet options are limited. The only feasible connection is by train, and this means the construction of a new railway line. A suspension bridge, however, is out of the question. The force of the wind rushing through the Tuyer gorges is too strong and would make the bridge swing dangerously. Circumventing the Tuyer is not a valid solution either. The costs will be astronomical. There's only one way, to cross the Tuyer directly. It's then that a young state engineer, Léon Boyer, decides to copy an already existing bridge and to take on the same geographical constraints. In the last quarter of the 19th century, Gustave Eiffel is a household name. He's just finished the sublime Maria Pia Bridge in Portugal, 352 meters long and 61 meters high. Eiffel has proved that he can achieve astounding feats whatever the conditions and build big while reducing costs as much as possible. The state and the railway companies demanded that the firms to whom the work would be assigned deposited a bond to ensure that they would go on to the end. Eiffel associates with Thierfil Serig, another brilliant engineer, and a man with the financial means to put down the required money. 
The two men decide that the viaduct will be 200 meters long and rise 120 meters above the level of the river. At the time, no bridge has ever reached such a height. Garabit would become the largest metal structure in the world so far. It seems a huge gamble, but it's the solution that's retained by the state. A state which will not exactly facilitate Eiffel's task. Access to the Tuyer gorges is non-existent since there isn't a single road. It was all the more crazy since logic would have called for building the railway line at least up to one end of the viaduct first. But that wasn't to be. Transporting materials to the gorge is a major headache right from the beginning. The bridge was to be in working condition before the railway line was built, so the railway people were cautious and a little sceptical. After unloading at the nearest train station, all metal parts of the viaduct must then be transported to Garabit by horse and oxen over 34 kilometers. This would greatly extend the duration of the construction, which lasted four years, while usually Eiffel did everything under two years. To compensate for the delay, Eiffel decides to build a veritable village at the foot of the viaduct. 400 workers and their families will have housing, a bakery and even a school. In January 1880, Work on the abutments, as well as on the foundations for the five piers, begins. The good news is that no deep digging is needed to anchor them firmly in the rock. The masonry is done by a team from Italy. The work is considerable. It takes two years to raise the seven bases. At the same time, Eiffel is building an essential prerequisite for the construction of the viaduct, an ephemeral bridge. He used this service bridge to put the various parts in place. The heaviest of these were hoisted by winches. Thus, the transfer of materials between the riverbanks is simplified. And thanks to this bridge, the arch can be spanned over the void. Yet before that, all metal pylons are erected. With varying heights from 24 to 60 meters, their structure clearly shows one of the hallmarks of the engineer, also present on the Eiffel Tower. The diagonal, or St. Andrew's Cross. The crosses provide the structure with an internal balance and they prevent deformations which may be caused by gales. If a pylon is made up of solid panels, it provokes a strong resistance to wind bursts. The key to the construction of these girders is the use of rivets, which allow two parts to be assembled. It's done by driving a small rod through two metal plates. The rod is heated beforehand until it's glowing red. Once between the two plates, the other end is hit to give it a second head. When the rivet cools, it retracts and holds the metal parts as close together as possible. On this bridge, there are 678,768 rivets. Exactly. Today, these rivets are one of the main concerns of maintenance. With time and the daily passage of trains causing strong vibrations, some may come loose and no longer keep the plates properly fixed to each other. So parts of the viaduct are regularly checked with this problem in mind. We use a small hammer to sound the rivet and according to the sound it produces, we can tell if it's deconsolidated or if the paint is just a bit cracked. With the 678,768 rivets of the viaduct, it is indeed a tedious operation. The rivets, of course, will also weld the upper part of the viaduct, the deck or apron. This is where the rails will be put. It's built as and when the piers are finished, literally pushed forward from both ends of the bridge. From the western end, the deck will advance to 103 meters. 
It's on the eastern side that the distance to be covered is longest, 282 meters. It will take 60 days to advance the western deck. Its opposite part will require 164 days of pushing. The workers lever and advance the deck 11 centimeters each time. For sliding, the structure is rested on pebbles at the top of the pylons. And so, to the sound of a bugle, everyone simultaneously raises and pushes the apron. However, the deck cannot be put into place just yet. At more than 100 meters above the void, between the two largest pylons, it needs a solid structure to rest upon. This will be the Great Arch, the largest ever built, with a record weight of 1,200 tons. In the 19th century, it's truly a tour de force. Cables fixed to the deck and to the pylons will retain the parts of the arch as it's built. So we have a structure that holds. We extend it, put parts on it, until there is a moment when there's no longer a balance to the added weight. So we support this new part by cables connected to the part that has already been mounted, and then we continue. The calculations were so accurate that the two parts met within half a centimetre from their ideal position. It was enough to drive in a bolt after one last massive push. Thus, on April 24, 1884, at 6 p.m. precisely, after four years of work, the two half arches are joined at a height of 122 metres. With their respective weight of 600 tons, they lock themselves above the void. Their combined masses, leaning against each other, ensure stability. There's no need for cables to support them. At the time, this arch with a base width of 165 meters is the largest in the world, twice the width of the Champs-Élysées. It's a stunning achievement. Now, finally, the deck can be put into place. Once the arch is well anchored, the viaduct is completed by advancing the rail deck from both ends. When joined, it has a length of 564 meters. This operation heralds the end of the work. It's time for the finishing touches, like putting on a new layer of paint. The red color is the same later used on the Eiffel Tower. It's due to lead, an additive for rust protection common at the time, but highly carcinogenic. Back then, all bridges were red because of the minimum. The use of minimum or lead-based paints today is forbidden. All parts from the Eiffel de Levallois Perret factories are pre-painted. But they applied a layer at the end of the work, and so it's red. With any metallic structure, the risk is rust. Yet FL has bypassed the problem with the very structure of the viaduct. There are no confined areas conducive to the formation of rust. Since his viaduct is very airy, a strong wind will easily sweep the humidity away. The architectural novelty is praised the world over. There remains only one last test in order to ensure the viability of the viaduct. How will it behave under the repeated passage of hundreds of tons over its deck? The tests were done with a train that consisted of a 75-ton locomotive and 15 cars. The train was positioned above the arch and they measured a deformation of the structure of 8 millimeters, which is nothing on a structure like that. Although the effect is only a few millimeters, Eiffel wanted to obtain maximum flexibility in his bridge. So the engineer has essential pieces added at the base of the arch. They are ball joints that allow the structure to move. Each of them is anchored with two steel cylinders in the concrete bases of the viaduct. Thus, the arches can move a few millimeters by pivoting up or down. 
Each joint is like a kneecap. It allows for rotational movements to adapt to a possible bending of the structure. But it took some years until these tests could be conducted. Although the viaduct of Garabit was ready in 1884, no railroad had yet arrived. The politicians, despite the green light given to Gustave Eiffel, had always had doubts as to the feasibility of the project. Thus, four more years will pass before the first train will make its appearance on the viaduct. In 1888, Garabit finally sees the first trains pass over the Tuyer River. Meanwhile, Eiffel has dedicated himself to his tower in the heart of Paris, which is finished one year after the inauguration of the viaduct. Yet for many specialists, Garabit remains an achievement even more impressive than the Eiffel Tower. It stunned engineers and railroad companies the world over. It became a reference work. The construction of the bridge was a highlight of civil engineering at an international level and a boost for an entire economic sector. The viaduct of Garabit is presently under review for classification as a World Heritage Site, an honour already bestowed on the Pont du Gard. As for the viaduct of Millau, it will undoubtedly keep on fascinating the public for decades to come. Three bridges, which each in its own way, has proved that civil engineering can come close to art.